It's just a really great season for us uh, of just not only seeing uh, God raise up new leadership in politics in the White House, but also, uh, honestly, for the third term in a row now, Governor, uh, Congressman Hurt uh, being reelected. He is from the 5th District here, and I get the privilege of introducing him before he introduces our honored guests for this day for our keynote. Come on, put your hands together for Congressman Hurt, everybody. Good morning, Liberty University. I want to thank uh, you all for letting me be with you this morning. It, it has been an honor to uh, represent uh, Virginia's 5th District in the U.S. Congress for the last uh, six years. Uh, it's an honor to be with you and represent uh, Liberty University there. Uh, the last time I was here uh, was at a convocation uh, featuring a, a guy that uh, we all know very well now, and that is Donald J. Trump. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's going to be a very, very exciting time uh, for our country over the next four years. I think it's a call for every American uh, to put our shoulder to the wheel uh, and do what's right for this country, uh, not only uh, to live up the legacy of our founders, but also uh, as important to, uh, to create opportunities uh, for the next generation so that when you are prepared to leave this place, uh, that there will be opportunity for you uh, and our children and our grandchildren. It's an honor to be able to introduce our special guest today. Uh, Michael Reagan is a son of Ronald Reagan, an Academy Award winning actress, Jane Wyman. He's author of three books, On the Outside Looking In, Twice Adopted, and his latest book, Lessons My Father Taught Me. Uh, he's a radio sh show host for over 26 years. He's the founder and chairman of the Reagan Legacy Foundation. And uh, Michael, I hope we're going to hear some more about this. He's a world champion powerboat racer. We've all seen him on television and heard him on the radio. Uh, he is somebody that uh, has certainly carried on the legacy of his father, a, a, a true American legacy, and, and uh, every step of the way, uh, I think that we have, uh, have seen him uh, demonstrate what his father stood for, and that is conservative values, common sense values, uh, values of compassion, uh, but really ultimately American values. So it's an honor to be able to uh, introduce him uh, before he comes up. It's, uh, it's time to look at a video about Michael Reagan. Thank you. For more on this story, we're pleased to be joined by political commentator Michael Reagan. Son of President Ronald Reagan, Newsmax contributor and author of Lessons My Father Taught Me, The Strength, Integrity, and Faith of Ronald Reagan. It is a must read for every conservative. Now, what, what do you find as people uh, ask you about your book? What do you find that they want to know most of all about your dad? I mean, everybody knows him as the president or the governor. They know him on the political side. And all they know about the personal side is basically what they've read in the newspapers at one point or another. No one has done more to apply Reagan's principles than Michael. Michael Reagan calls us back to Ronald Reagan's principles, which saved America once and can do so again. Michael Reagan takes us inside the mind of the man who inspired a reawakening of the American spirit. Liberty University. Please welcome the son of our 40th president, Michael Reagan. That would be me. Yeah. Good morning. I'm going to move out here. Is that all right? I like walking. How is everyone? It, it is it's great to be back at Liberty University. I was here a couple years ago, and either I got it all wrong, and you had me back, or I got it all right, and you wanted me back anyway. So it, it's good to be here and to be invited to come back and speak at, at Liberty University to all of you. I know you all volunteered to show up this morning. Um, and I want to talk to you a little bit about my father, about my book, Lessons My Father Taught Me, really about my life, how it all comes together. Uh, being introduced as the son of Ronald Reagan and Jane Wyman, you need to understand there's only two people ever born or ever raised in the family of an Academy Award winning actress, Jane Wyman a man who would ultimately become the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan. And those two people were my sister Maureen, who passed in, in 2000 from melanoma, and of course myself. And we feel pretty lucky, even though it wasn't always great, we feel pretty lucky, and I felt pretty lucky to, to be in the, in the Reagan family. A lot of people want to know how it was growing up in the Reagan family. I remember I was speaking at Eureka College, which was the alma mater of my father. 
And I was speaking in their chapel a couple years ago. And I got done speaking, and I asked for questions, and hand went up from a gentleman in the, in the pews, and he said, Mr. Reagan, when did you know there was a God? And I said, well, that's pretty easy. I said, I was a young boy. It was my mother's birthday. My sister and I decided to ride our bikes down to Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills and get something for our mother. And yes, my sister Maureen and I had credit on Rodeo Drive when we were younger. All of us brats in Hollywood had credit on Rodeo Drive when we were younger. It was kind of a neat deal. And when we got to this store, I noticed this silver serving tray. And the silver tra uh, tray, serving tray, had an imprint of this gorgeous blonde woman draped in red satin. And I said to my sister Maureen, four years my senior, let's get this for mom. And Maureen said, we can't get that for mom. I said, no, it's really pretty, Merm. Let's get it for mom. She said, Michael, we've got to get something else. This isn't going to work out. And so the sister, four years my senior, won out, of course, and we got something else for our mother. And we had it wrapped and sent to the house, and we rode our bikes back to the house. And that evening, I was the delegated door opener for my, my mother's birthday party. And I would go to the door when it would ring the doorbell and open it up and tell the people where to go in the house. Well, the doorbell rang this one time, and I opened up the door. I'm 10 years old. I open up the door, and I am looking at that blonde-haired woman who was on that silver serving tray, Marilyn Monroe. And that's when I knew there was a God. <laughs> you got to find him somehow. And that's the day I found him. That's the day I knew there was a God. I, I was telling him backstage before we came out about growing up and having such iconic parents and trying to find your, your own way, and it didn't matter what you do, you never rise above who your parents are. So people don't know what you've accomplished. You probably didn't know I had five world records of powerboat racing. You probably didn't know I was out for world champion in 1967, inboard rookie of the year. You didn't know I robbed a bank last week. I talk about that, that, you know, I'm the guy who walks into a bank, robs the bank, walks out, and the police officer standing in front of the bank goes to arrest me and goes, oh my God, your father was the greatest president this country ever had. I can't believe I'm arresting you. Do, do you mind if I, can I get a selfie and send it to my wife before I arrest you? That's the world you live in. And that's the world my son Cameron lives in, also the world my daughter Ashley lives in and also the world my wife, Colleen, lives in. And by the way, you can also give applause to my wife, Colleen. She's not here, but she, for some reason, just celebrated her 41st wedding anniversary with me last Monday. <laughs> Met this little Nebraska girl on a blind date on December 7th, 1973, and I can't get rid of her. She stays around. And my life changed because of her, ultimately. You know, there's a lot of people talking about my father as president, the great president that he was. But I knew him as dad. And people ask me, when was the greatest moments you had with your father? And they were when I was young. When I would take those rides out to the ranch on any given Saturday morning, my parents were divorced when I was three years old, and it was terrible to both my sister and myself. But my father never forgot the obligation that he had a family other than his new family, which would be Nancy and Patty. And so on Saturday mornings, he would take that station wagon and turn the corner onto Beverly Glen and see me sitting on the curb with my sister Maureen or sitting on the curb with a friend, and he would pick us up and go out to the ranch. And I learned about America riding out to the ranch. I heard every song, every hymn of every military organization ever known to mankind going out to the ranch. He would sing it to me. 
And he would tell me about the greatness of America. And it's interesting, he was sharing this with an 8, 9, 10, 11 year old boy going out to the ranch. And years later, he would be president of the United States of America. And, and, and he would pass the largest tax break in American history. And he had to pass that tax break with the help of the Speaker of the House, who was a Democrat. How did he do that? Well, he did it by inviting the Speaker of the House up to the White House for dinner. And, and the next day, the Speaker would go back to his staff and say, listen, I'm going to carry the President's tax package to the American people. And Tip O'Neill's people looked at him and said, are you out of your mind? You disagree with everything Ronald Reagan stands for, and you're going to carry the legislation? You know that there's enough conservative Democrats on the House side that that legislation will pass. How can you do this? What did he promise you? What did the President say to you to make you do this? And Tip O'Neill looked at his staff and said, well, he never talked about taxes all night long. He said, the President invited you up with your wife to have dinner and never spoke about taxes? Well, no. Well, what did he speak about? He spoke about the greatness of America, the goodness of her people. And before I knew it, I'm having a glass of wine with the President, and we're telling Irish stories. And today I'm telling you I'm going to carry the legislation that's going to give the American people a tax break. He shared with Tip O'Neill the same things he was sharing with an eight, nine, ten-year-old boy many years before. So Ronald Reagan didn't just change when he became president or governor and say, oh, I have to wear this shoe because that's what my constituents want. He was always the same, whether it was with an eight-year-old child or the Speaker of the House. And I was able to see this growing up, riding out to the ranch for 15 and 20 years. If you wanted to really see my father, you went horseback riding with him. You went out and shot ground squirrels. You went swimming. You were lucky enough to buy him his first chainsaw, to which the oak trees have never forgiven me. That's how you got to see my father. And that's how he got to see you and share things with you. And it made me feel good as I went through life and I saw him as governor, as president, that he was the same. No matter if he was elected governor or president, he wasn't any different with me than he had been before he got into politics. I like to joke that, you know, the good news is you run for politics, you win. The bad news is you win. Because unfortunately, what happens is when you win, with the laws they are today in fundraising, you spend most of your time out raising money instead of being with your family. It's very tough. A lot of people don't see what a family goes through when mom or dad aren't able to be there because they have to be with their constituents. They have to be out there raising, raising money. My father also taught me something else. He taught me, don't be a quitter. Don't let failure stop you from success. And he lived that very thing. You know, he was an actor. As he would say, he was the king of the bees. My mother, by the way, was king of the A's. Got to have a mom. And my dad, when it wasn't going well with acting at the motion picture level, got into television, found another direction. And he was doing TV, General Electric Theater, back in the 1960s. This is after he took a job in Las Vegas as a stand-up because he hadn't gotten a job acting in a while and he needed money to take care of his family. And he got this job on General Electric Theater as the host of it. Ultimately, that show would be canceled, not because of ratings, but because of politics. And he was sitting there saying, now what do I do? And he had been out speaking around the country, speaking at GE plants and what have you. And now, he had more time, so he ended up writing a new speech. In 1962, he changed his registration from Democrat to Republican, and the speech he wrote was something you might study someday called the time for choosing. He gave it October of 
1964 for Barry Goldwater. And it changed the course of Ronald Reagan's life forever. I went from being Jane Wyman's son, who I was known as until 1964, to becoming Ronald Reagan's son after 1964 because of that speech, A Time for Choosing. And he would go on then to run for governor of the state of California. When he was running for the governor of the state of California, I was working on a trucking dock in Los Angeles, loading oil well freight from 5 at night till 1.30 in the morning. My parents believed they had, well, my parents both had a birth defect. It was called the work ethic, which was quite upsetting to a brat from Beverly Hills who saw other children with rich parents buying them everything they want, and my parents thinking, you need to work for everything that you want. I had to sign a note with my mother to uh, borrow money from her to buy a bike when I was 10. When I dropped out of college, my parents locked the doors front and back, <laughs> said, you know, while you were in college, we were taking care of you. You left. Go find your own place to live and get a job. And that's why I was working on a trucking dock in 1964 when he became governor in 1966, when he became governor of the state of California. I had to go down and buy a suit for that night. I thought my life would change and things would get easier. I asked my dad for a job the night that he won. I found out that night that my father didn't believe in nepotism. Had I known that, I would have voted for the other guy. <clears throat> that was the Brown family. You might notice there's still a Brown governor of the state of California, but not a Reagan, even though they probably need a Reagan as governor of the state of California. So we went on from there. My father always teaching me a lesson. And like you, when I was younger, I didn't see all those lessons. I didn't understand them. I was jealous that other people were taking my dad's time away from me. Even though I was having those Saturdays at the ranch, I really wanted more time. I wanted more time with my parents, but they were in a business and an industry that just wasn't conducive to it. Both actors out on, you know, doing movies. So many of us in Hollywood were put into boarding schools. And that's where I was. Somebody asked me one time, they said, when did you leave home? Did you leave when you were 18? I said, no, I think I left when I was six. Because I went to boarding school when I was six years of age. I would go on Sunday night at seven o'clock and be home on Friday. Dad would pick me up, mom would take me to school. But we would board at school and it was very tough on children of famous actors because we all went to these boarding schools. We'd cry ourselves to sleep at night, wanting to be with our parents, and we became very angry at our parents. We got very jealous of children who, in fact, would be taken to school by their moms or their dads or by the housekeeper, whoever it might be, and they would get picked up in the afternoon after school at 3.30 or 4, 5 o'clock, whenever it might be and we'd have to stay at school. But I did learn something, and my family found this out a long time ago. I love burnt toast on one side and burnt cookies on the bottom. Because when you go to boarding school, that's about all you get. So you get an appetite for things that are burnt. And so when something's burnt at the house, everybody says, give it to dad. Dad will in fact eat it. As we went through life and what have you, I also learned something else from my dad. You know, be who you are. Take a stand and don't be afraid of taking a stand. Know what you believe and why you believe it. And he taught me that as a young child, that he never wavered from his beliefs. He always was who he was. When he gave speeches, he always knew who the audience was, like today. I'm speaking here to thousands of young college students and at Liberty University, but I'm also 
speaking to another group that's streaming this on television, whether it be Newsmax or Liberty University. And then you will all go out and you'll share it with someone else. You either share the good or the bad, whatever you feel. And my father knew this too. My father knew that you always have a bigger audience than the audience that's in front of you. So when my father, for example, as president, gave the evil empire speech, I think we all remember, to the evangelicals back in 83. I think your father was there too. A lot of people believe, hey, the audience were the evangelicals in front of my father. But who was the audience other than the people in front of him who would applaud? The audience that he was speaking to was a half a world away in gulags. The Nate and Sharanskys of the world who were being kept in gulags by an evil empire called the Soviet Union. That was the group he was speaking to. And my father didn't even know that the message got through till he was president of the United States. When one day Nate and Sharansky would, the dissident would make an appointment to come visit the president. And we would walk into my father's office and he would tell my father that while he was in the gulag with others, they were made aware of his evil empire speech and one of the guards in fact told them what you had said and we tapped out the speech in code on the floor of the gulag to the cheers of all of us that were in the gulag. My father was so excited that he had heard it and did not know for all those many years. He called in his complete staff and said, meet Nate and Sharansky. He heard the speech. He actually heard the speech and he liked it. Who's your audience? When you go out and you speak, when you go meet with a friend, who are you really speaking to? Who's your audience you're speaking to? Who's listening? And in the world we live in today, a lot more people are listening. As long as you've got a smartphone, ask any member of Congress, ask anybody, ask Trump, you know, about things that are in fact copied on cell phones or tape recorders. Who's your audience? Who are you trying to reach out to? When my father spoke at the uh, Brandenburg Gate, July of 1987, the tear down the wall speech, which everybody remembers, who was the audience? Was the audience the groups in front of him that he was speaking to? They were all free. No, the audience he was speaking to were the ones behind the Brandenburg Gate, those that were not free. And he wanted them to know there was a president, in fact, was going to do everything he could to, in fact, make them free. I learned that back in 1962 before my dad even thought about running for office. I learned about that Brandenburg Gate. I learned about the evil empire. I learned about how the evil empire had put people behind a wall within 24 hours. That's how quickly those people, in fact, lost their freedom. So wherever you spent the night, August 12th, 1961, if you spent it in East Germany, and you spent the night with your aunt, your uncle, the next morning you woke up, you couldn't get home because there was barbed wire and a wall going up. That's how quickly you can lose your freedom. And my dad spoke about that to me in a car driving out to the ranch. That's where I learned it. And we all learned it years later when he spoke about it as President of the United States of America. Things you learn sitting in a car with your father when there's no politics in the way, it's just him and you and him turning on the radio and I'm having to listen to the swinging years with Chuck Cecil and all these old songs from his era that just bored the heck out of me. But I did turn the station to the Beach Boys 
and he used to tell me how the world's going to go to heck in a handbasket if we keep listening to that music. And ultimately, the Beach Boys became one of his favorite groups. So I, I take the credit for the Beach Boys being one of his favorite groups, because that's what I would do with the station, instead of listening to that little brown jug stuff by somebody named Glenn. Those are great times, great moments, because I saw those things as a child and then saw them lived out as I was getting into my adult years. You know, I'd never seen my, my father lose either. I mean, that generation didn't really share with the children when things weren't good. First time I saw my father lose was 1976 when he lost the nomination for the Republican Party. Another time he turned lemons into lemonade. I asked my father that night after he lost the nomination, why did you even want to run for president? Which is a good question to ask anybody running for office to see if they have an answer. He said, Michael, for so long I've watched an American president sit down with secretary generals of the Soviet Union. And every time we sit down with them, they always ask us to give up something to get along with them. He said, I wanted to win the nomination in the presidency so I could sit down with the secretary general of the Soviet Union. And while he was telling me what it was I was going to have to give up to get along with them, I was going to get up from my chair, walk around the other side of the table, lean over and whisper in his ear, "Nyet." I want to be the first president to say "Nyet" to a secretary general of the Soviet Union. Now that was in August of 1976. Nancy had not told my father yet that she was going to run him again in 1980. But he ran again in 1980, became president of the United States. And 10 years almost to the date, in I think October of 1986, Mikhail Gorbachev calls my father to Reykjavik, Iceland, to meet, to sign an agreement. And my father gets there, Mikhail Gorbachev says to my father, if you want me to sign on to this agreement, Mr. President, you're going to have to give up SDI. You're going to have to give up Star Wars. My father looked at him, and what do you think he said? Nyet. And he turned around, and he walked away from Reykjavik. Everyone in my father's group that was there, everybody who worked for my father in the administration and knew about this meeting, every single one of them thought my father should sign on to the agreement because they were concerned about the legacy of Ronald Reagan. The only person in the room who wasn't worried about the legacy of Ronald Reagan was Ronald Reagan. And you will find as you go forward, if you go forward looking for a legacy, you will never find it. Let the legacy find you. And if you do the right things, it will find you as it found Ronald Reagan. My father walked away from Reykjavik, and everybody said it was a failure. Time Magazine, Newsweek Magazine, Washington Post, ABC, NBC, CBS. Mikhail Gorbachev even wrote in his own book, it was a net heard round the world. But because of that net, we would ultimately move closer to what would ultimately happen at the Berlin Wall coming down in 1989, because Ronald Reagan stayed true to his beliefs. He didn't do what everybody in his administration wanted him to do because they were worried about a legacy. He did what was right. And as you go through life, you're going to have people pulling on you to do what they want you to do because they're concerned about not your legacy, they're concerned about their future. And that's what you'll find out. And you have to be strong enough to say, what do I believe and why do I believe it? And how do I move forward from here and do the right thing? Because when you're in business or school or governor or president, prime minister, it's about doing the right thing for the people who in fact put you in power. And so Ronald Reagan 
was going to follow through with the things that he had been speaking about since the early 1960s. He was going to stay strong against the Soviet Union and do the right thing by the American people. There was another great lesson my father taught me. Don't worry who gets the credit. On his desk, there was a, there's a placard that says, no telling what a man can do and what he can accomplish if he doesn't worry who gets the credit. How many friends of yours here at the school, when you get together, don't want to share the credit? And you end up getting nothing accomplished. They want to take all the credit. Ronald Reagan didn't believe in that. He didn't believe in it when he was talking to me riding out to the ranch, talking about the greatness of America, not, never talked or used the word I, used the word we. He looked at the big picture. What's the big picture? What is it that you want to accomplish? And look at the big picture and go towards that instead of micromanaging all the time. And that's what he would do. You know, an agreement that was not signed in 1986, though, was signed in 1987. You know where it was signed? Washington, D.C. Just an example of taking credit. My father gave the START agreement to Mikhail Gorbachev three times. Three times, Mikhail Gorbachev walked away from the table. Three times. 1987, Mikhail Gorbachev would be would bring his START agreement to Washington, D.C. to be signed by the President. The START agreement that Mikhail Gorbachev would bring to my father in Washington, D.C. would be basically word for word, period for period, exclamation point for exclamation point, the same agreement that he had walked away from the table with three times. My father didn't sit there and say, wait a minute, that's my agreement. What do you mean bringing this to me? What are you thinking? No, my father didn't care who got the credit. He wanted the agreement signed. And so he signed that agreement. And he let Mikhail Gorbachev take the credit because he knew that he had to build up Mikhail Gorbachev in his own country, make him look like a hero in his country that he was working towards an end if he wanted to accomplish the big pictures of bringing down that wall. Don't worry who gets the credit. Work towards the big picture. What is it you're trying to accomplish? And what can you accomplish working together that you can't accomplish working by yourself? And all of you have friends like that. I have friends like that. Or used to. Now they don't talk to me anymore. What can I say? But no, you've got to do this. These are just one of the tenets of things that I learned from my father. I learned about faith from my father. 1988, I hitched a ride on Air Force One. Let me tell you something. It is really cool when you can hitch a ride on Air Force One. Really cool. Spent the night at the White House. My first book had come out on the outside looking in. And uh, hitched a ride with my dad. We were going to go back Good Friday to California. My dad was going to go up to the ranch, spend Easter weekend at the ranch. I was going to go back home to my house in Los Angeles, spend it with my family, of course. And as we were landing at Point Magoo, California, my dad, who I always knew was a strong Christian, never missed church on a Sunday morning, quoted the Bible. In fact, my father, if you really go back and read through his speeches, you're going to find out my father spoke to us in parables, not in sound bites. He talked about us in stories. He would tell me stories. And I mean, I learned about the tax system in America through stories. When I asked him for an increase in allowance and he told me about the tax system in America, how the government was taking 90 cents out of every dollar with the 10 cents that was left. He had to take care of my mother, my sister, myself, his new wife, Nancy, their new daughter, Patty, had to take care of the home he was living in, the ranch, the cows, the horses, the foreman. 
driving into the ranch that day, I actually offered back half my allowance to my father, and I was only getting a buck. But he said, when the president's elected gives me a tax break, I'll give you a larger allowance. So I found myself becoming very political at the age of nine or 10. Didn't know Democrat from Republican, knew more money from less, and what have you. But he talked to us and told us stories. And so as we're landing at Point Magoo on Good Friday, 1988, he counts out on his fingers the number nine. And I said, what is important about the number nine? What does that mean to you? He said, nine more months, I'll no longer be the President of the United States. I said, and you're looking forward to that? He says, yes, I am. I said, why? He says, ever since I looked out the rear window of my limousine March 30th, 1981, and saw other men laying in pools of their own blood with bullets that were meant for me, I haven't wanted to put other people in harm's way because someone wanted to take my life. And so I haven't gone to church on a regular basis. And I know that when I leave the presidency, I can once again go visit with my Lord and Savior on any given Sunday. I said to my dad, are you going to go this Sunday? He said, no, we don't. There's no plans to leave the ranch and go to church. I said, you ought to try it. Get in the practice. I didn't know what he did that Sunday until a few years ago I was speaking. And uh, John Barletta, who was the Secret Service agent in charge of the ranch, was in the audience. And he came up to me afterwards, he says, you're the guy. I said, I'm the guy, what? He said, when your father woke up Easter morning, he called the Secret Service on the ring down, and he said, I want to go to church. So we had to get all the cars up on the hill, and your father actually went to church that Easter Sunday morning. I didn't know that until about three or four years ago. The effect I had telling my dad he should go. But what does the president think about when he's ready to leave? My father was thinking about visiting with God and how he missed not being able to do that for all those years. Another thing my father taught me, of course, was having a sense of humor. If you don't know how to laugh, you'll never get through anything. My father had a great sense of humor, but he used a sense of humor so often to, to put other people at ease. When he was shot, March 30th, 1981, You'll probably read or you've heard the audio of him telling the doctors, I hope you're all Republicans. Told Nancy when she showed up, honey, I forgot to duck. But what does he tell his son and his family, me and my family, as we walk in at 10 o'clock the next morning, having flown from the West Coast? This is like maybe six, seven hours after he's off the table in his hospital room. And I walk in and I see my father, I said, good morning, Dad. My dad looks up at me, he says, well, good morning. I said, well, Dad, uh, how you doing? He says, well, if you're ever going to get shot, don't be wearing a new suit. <laughs> I say, excuse me? Well, you know, yesterday when I was shot, I had just picked up that suit, wore it for the first time yesterday, and when I walked into the hospital, well, you'd think they let me undress, I am the president. But no, they put me on a gurney, and they actually sh they cut that suit off my body. The last time I saw it was in, sh in shreds in the corner of the hospital room. I said, really? He said, that's why I tell you, if you're ever going to get shot, don't be wearing a new suit. <laughs> and I said, well, thank you, Dad. I, I'll tell Colleen that. And uh, he said, that young man who shot me. I said, yes, John Hinckley. Yes, John Hinckley, that's who it was. I said, yeah. Well, understand his parents are in the oil business. Yes, they are, Dad. Well, I understand they live in Denver. Yep, they live in Denver. Well, you think they have any money? I said, okay, Dad, they live in Denver, they're in the oil business. Yeah, they probably have money. Well, do you ever think they'd buy me a new suit? <laughs> they never did. That's all he ever wanted was that new suit from the Hinckley family to replace the one he had just worn for the first time that day. But that was my dad. He made you feel at ease through his humor, through his humor. 
You know, all these things I've told you, you know, I write about these things and a lot more in my book, Lessons My Father Taught Me. But I didn't learn all those lessons while they were happening. I had to look back and see what the lessons were he was trying to teach me. Because it wasn't all wonderful for me during my life. A lot of people might have read my book a couple years ago, Twice Adopted. I was very angry. If I asked people in this audience or people watching as we stream on, on the internet, if I, ever, if I asked any of you, has anybody in this room ever felt they were going to go to hell? Would they raise their hands? He's not here. If you ever felt that God hated you, would you raise your hand? How many people here at some point in their life, something's happened to you that caused you to hate God with every fiber in your body? Would you raise your hand? I've done all those things. At the same time, hated my family because I blame them for all the things that happened to me that weren't good. See, when I was in boarding school, it wasn't as bad as maybe it could have been. But one year, my mother took me out, put me to an after-school program at a day school. And she would sign me up for after-day school events with a gentleman who would teach me how to throw a football, teach me how to throw a baseball, teach me to do the things I thought would be great so I could impress my father with all my knowledge. But I didn't realize he was grooming me. And so when I was eight years old, third grade, he began to sexually molest me. And that would go on for the better part of that year, actually all the year, until one day he would take me up to the Santa Monica Mountains, have me take my clothes off and take nude photographs of me. And three days later, he would tell my mother he's taking me to dinner, He'd take me back to his apartment, to a makeshift dark room, which I know that's what it is now, but didn't know it as an eight-year-old. And he would develop a photograph, and it was magic to an eight-year-old's eyes, now nine. And he would say, would you like to do this too? Would you like to develop a photo? I said, yeah put a pair of tongs in my right hand, and he put a piece of paper in the tongs. And he moved my arm from one pan to a second pan to a third pan, and what came up with a nude picture he had taken of me a few days earlier. I literally went into shock. He put his hand on my right shoulder. He said, wouldn't your mother like to have a copy of this? That day, I walked away from any time being with God. I walked away from my mother, I walked away from my father, walked away from life, and it didn't get any better. I didn't tell anybody. I was worried. Back in that day, which is much different than today, I worried about, will people think if they find out I'm homosexual? I was scared to death in everything I did. I was angry. I was mad. I burned off all of my friends because I was worried if they ever found out what I had done, they would walk away from me. My family didn't walk away from me, but didn't know why I was so angry, why I was so mad, why I stopped going to church, why I hated God, why I took it out on my mother. I used to call her Miss Wyman. She moved me in with my dad to go into high school. Ended up leaving that high school, going to another high school. Ended up dropping out of college. I was worried about being a success because I knew that if I was with the media, somebody would find those photographs and put them up and ruin my life. When my dad ran for governor, scared me that somebody would bring up those photos. And everybody would know the secret I had held for years. In my first book on the outside looking in, 
A friend of mine called me before the book was published and said, what happens if the photographs come up before the book is finished? And I write this in the book. If the photographs come up before the book is finished, I will not be alive to do the first interview. Suicide is an option. And I meant it. Too many children like me get abused every year, and suicide becomes an option. But the bigger option is God. How do you find God? And it was because of my wife, Colleen, I found God. When I started treating my son through anger the way I felt I'd been treated, my wife, Colleen, said, why are you yelling and screaming at Cameron? Why do you treat him like this? It's time for you to start asking God instead of blaming God. And that was the first time, 1983, 84, 85, that I've asked God first time for help. I appreciate those people who accept Christ and, boy, their life changes, bam. Every day I still have to accept Christ. Every day is a learning experience for me. Not once, but every single day. I have to remind myself that God is in charge of my life. And my life began to change. But I still blamed other people for my problems, my issues. I still worried about those photographs every single day. Those photographs were not destroyed until 2003 when the man who molested me died. And I got a letter from his sister-in-law who said, Michael, you can finally be at peace. The photographs have been destroyed. Photographs were taken in 1953. They weren't destroyed till 2003. They were still there. So I had every reason to be concerned about those things. How many here have ever made a deal with God? Nobody? Boy, that's great, because I do all the time. My deal with God was this. God, if you can get my father to tell me he loves me, I promise to serve you for the entire rest of my life. I was in church when I said it, and God said, well, okay. When was the last time you told your father you loved him? And I realized at that moment in time, as 1991, I had not told my father I loved him. And God said to me, he says, you know, well, the next time you're with him, why don't you try it? My, book, my dad had written a book, An American Life, and I was going to interview him on that book at my, in my radio show or at my radio show. And so I decided, okay, for the first time, I will listen to God instead of yell at God. And so I went up to my father when he came in to be interviewed by me, and I put my arms around him, and I hugged him, and I said, Dad, I love you. You know what my father said to me? Well, I love you too. And I thought to myself, so I've been blaming you and using you as an excuse for failure all these many years, and all I ever had to do was say I love you to him? I felt about this tall. We have a tendency sometimes, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> to blame others when it's best to look really at ourselves and say, what can we do? But you know, to be honest with you, with all the lessons I learned from my father, and my father would, and I would spend the rest of his life, every time we saw each other, we'd hug each other hello, hug each other goodbye. When he came down with Alzheimer's, hug each other hello, hug each other goodbye. And when he could not even say my name, and you worry, does he know who I am? His arms would simply open up because he recognized me as the guy who hugged him hello and hugged him goodbye. And one time, Colleen and I were up visiting my father at the house, or visiting Nancy, actually. You couldn't visit with Dad anymore, he would just be there. Just he was that deep into it at that point. And uh, something came up, and I had to leave, so. I walked out of the house, walked to my car. And Colleen looked at me and she said, honey, you forgot something. And I said, what I forget? She said, look at the front door. My dad 
heavy into Alzheimer's with Nancy's help had taken little baby steps all the way to the front door of the house because he had remembered that I had forgotten to hug him goodbye. And he was standing in the front door of the house with his arms open. I, Alzheimer's free, had forgotten to hug him goodbye. I ran back to that front door, put my arms around him and gave him a hug and said, I love you. And he gave me a little squeeze and turned and went in. You know, Christ stands in our doors every single day with his arms wide open, waiting to hug us, take away our pain. Thank God for that, that there's somebody there who, in fact, will do that each and every day. But probably the best lesson my father taught me out of all this was forgiveness. My father laying in a hospital bed being shot by an assassin's bullet. What is the first thing my father did before he went back to the White House to assume his presidential duties? Got down on his knees. Let me ask this question. How many people here know the Lord's Prayer? How many live the Lord's Prayer? Because I know two people who do and did. My father got down on his knees and he recited the Lord's Prayer and then asked God to forgive John Hinckley, who tried to, in fact, murder him. A few months later, in Rome, Italy, Pope John Paul II would be in his Pope mobile riding around St. Peter's Square, and a would-be assassin would shoot him, and he would be taken to the hospital. He would live. But before Pope John Paul II would go back to his papal duties, he got down on his knees, recited the Lord's Prayer, and asked for forgiveness for the man who, in fact, tried to kill him. And when my father, the Protestant, and the Pope would get together in Rome a few months later, look at what they had in common to talk about. Did it hurt? Whatever it was, look what they had to talk about. That God saved their lives. In fact, my father, because his life was spared, dedicated the rest of his presidency to God. But now you had the Pope and my father getting together with a commonality, a purpose, and the fact that both of them, they felt, lived because there was a better forward program for them to take on, and that was freedom to an area of the world that had not been free in years. And they would work together to bring freedom to Poland, solidarity, and ultimately bring down the Berlin Wall. And neither one of them cared who got the credit. They just wanted people to, in fact, be free. And it started with a bullet, and they found a way from an assassin's bullet to prayer, to honor God, honor the Lord's Prayer, live it instead of recite it, get together. And because of that, the two of them, with the help of others, were able to, in fact, change the world. Now I'd like to do something. My dad actually did something of this nature at one of the conventions. He said that he would like to, uh, to end his talk with a prayer. Never been done a convention, Republican convention or any convention before. And so he did. And I've thought about this. So here's what I would like to do. Because I imagine there are people here, like me, who in fact, have had things that have been done to them, or things against them in many ways, or they've done things to other people. And they recited the Lord's Prayer, but have they lived it? So I would like this. I would like for us all to stand, join hands, and recite the Lord's Prayer. And when you get to the part
forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. When we get to that part, we get to that part what I would like. We all, we'll all do it together. I would like you to take, let's take a moment, let's take a moment and think about that debt that we want God to forgive. As we forgive our debtors, let's think about that person or persons who have done something wrong to us and take that moment to forgive them. So let's all join hands and let's recite the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, they will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Until, until I learned to forgive, I wasn't able to see, and this is in the book, I wasn't able to see the greatest gift my father gave me. When he passed away June 5th, 2004, closed his eyes for the last time, I knew where my father was headed. I knew he was going to be with his Lord and Savior, but I also knew that in fact someday all of us, including me, will join my Father as we stand in front of the heavenly host and sing to our Lord. Thank you very much. Michael, we're, we're so honored and privileged that you were willing to share your heart with us today, and we are also privileged to be able to hear firsthand the story of, a, of an American hero. I, was, I can remember like yesterday, October 3rd, 1980, I was a freshman here at Liberty, and your father came and spoke when he was running for president. It was very similar to 2016, our country had been through a very difficult time, and my father worked so hard to help your father get elected, and he took a lot of heat for it because his competition was a Southern Baptist Sunday school teacher. And so, but it was, it's, it just seems like history is repeating itself, having you here. And um, we're just, we're just so honored to, to, to host you today. And, and David leaned over and told me while you were speaking that you had decided with your own money to make your new book lessons my father taught me available to all of our students. And David's going to use Instagram to let you know how to get you a copy. So please give him a hand to thank him for that. <laughs> Apparently he's not as tight as his father. So thank you very much for that, Michael, and, and uh, you all are dismissed. Thank